it short because these, this guy's credentials, I wanted to give you an exhaustive list. It will bite into a valuable talk time. Extremely interesting and accomplished uh, colleague in the GP areas of compression and information theory and so on. And today we're gonna hear a very exciting uh, new research in, in these dimensions. But not what's exciting about he is that he also has a big part of his professional history as a straight up journalist, the Wall Street Journal. And even at that, he was fierceless uh, in the, uh, he was, sorry, uh, fearless in the face of um, boundaries and he exposed all sorts of very interesting scandals also from geeky areas. So he was always combining this geeky dimension with this journalistic one, and now he's back in the geeky world, but hopefully journalistic one. Uh, we haven't yet lost him, so good. And we, will, we all benefit from uh, these kind of new ways of, of thinking and doing things. I'm excited about his results. Well, thank you very much, Saki, for that very kind introduction. I don't live up to it. I will do my best. Um, I am here from across the street. I am an assistant professor of computer science. Um, I was recently uh, very pleased, thank you for a courtesy appointment here in electrical engineering. I, that may be ending in about an hour if you, uh, once you see what I have to say, but I hope that you'll take these words uh, in the spirit intended. And the message of my talk is boundless streams. What do we talk about when we talk about compression? What do we talk about when we talk about encoding? This is a famous diagram from some nobody. Where, anyone know where is this from? <laughs> this is from the Mathematical Theory of Communications. The yeah, from the 40s, back before they understood things like we do over in the Gates building. Yeah, there's this idea of these boxes here. There's an information source, which has a stream, symbols to a transmitter. There's a stream, a signal, there's a noise source, a stream to the receiver, stream to the destination. And, and the fact that you could decompose a system like this into streams was a revolutionary idea. I, I don't know, can it be credited to Shannon, this idea that you could separate the source from the channel? That's a, well, basically, okay, basically, well, Shannon. All right. That's like uh, the, the punchline of our course on this. Mm -hmm. The punchline, all right. Yeah, separate. What percentage of your field was written by, down by Shannon in one paper? Uh, 99. 99, okay. <laughs> That's like a punctuated equilibrium of progress. Okay. This is from uh, Cover and Thomas. Um, source encoder, there's a V to the N, which is like a the superscript for vector in this field for some reason, and then there's a stream with a channel encoder, and then x to the n, and v to the n, to the channel, to the channel, there's a stream here. This is from the CRC Communications Handbook. There's a source streaming to the FPC encoder, streaming to the discrete data channel, the modulator, and the channel, the demodulator, FPC encoder, and the sync, and you know it's real because there's like some curves and stuff. This is from Proacus Digital Communications. He has the most boxes of anyone in my <laughs> library last night. You, you can tell I was getting bored, here's my thumb, anyway. Uh, Information source and input transducer streaming to the source encoder, streaming to the channel encoder, streaming to the digital modulator to the channel. There's all this lines like this. This is kind of how we think about information. Here's a video encoder. Uh, there's a stream of pictures coming in off the camera, a stream of, of captures of exposure. You're giving us even more credit than we deserve. Oh, yeah. We're not even at, at streaming, we're usually at, at blocks of stuff. Yeah. Yes, that's so streaming true. Streaming is even. Streaming is even more. Yeah. Fair enough. More adaptive than we use other. Well, this, we're, we're going to talk about that. We're going we're gonna to search in that in that space. Here's a video encoder, a stream of pictures coming out of camera exposures from a CMOS sensor going into some encoder. What comes out of some stream of bits back into a decoder. What comes out of some fuzzy version of the original picture. What do we call this combination? The encoder decoder. A codec, encoder decoder, a codec. There's a stream of something you care about going in. There's a stream of don't worry your pretty little head about in the middle, and then a stream of some approximation at the end. There's that, that model. The message of the side, down streams. No streams, no Shannon, no Cover Thomas, that, that's the bit. Um, but we need to think beyond streams, because it turns out this abstraction limits the way we think, it limits the way we build systems. And if the only abstraction we have is a stream, it turns out we can't build certain kinds of systems. And this is compounded by the sort of disciplinary division and the way we use compression in practice in engineer systems. So typically, it's people in this kind of building that make the compression, they make the, the entropy compression, or the image compression, or the video compression. 
And there's a whole industry around it. You know, you buy a chip that's a video encoder. This is not something that you can sort of introspect. It's something that gets stamped out 10 million at a time by some factory in Asia. It's a chip that does one thing. It takes a stream in and a stream out. And us across the street, over in the Gates building, we're left sort of using the fruits of your labor. We're stuck with the abstractions that the people building the compression provide. If the only abstraction is a stream, we're stuck with that. And what my group and I have found in the circuit of computer systems is that if you can open up the black box, if you can do something other than a stream, a functional interface to compression, where we can understand what's going on inside the chip, you can do a lot more. And I'm gonna try and tell you about that with three case studies. So the first one, uh, in each of these cases, we build a functional approach to compression. I'm gonna tell you what that means. Instead of a streaming approach, a functional approach. The first one is about JPEGs. And this is the easiest one. I wouldn't normally talk about this, but uh, just as a sort of warm up, functional JPEG codec allowed us to take all of the pictures in Dropbox, so they have about an exabyte of people's data, about 35% of it is people's JPEGs. We were able to take those JPEGs and compress them by about 23%, so hundreds of petabytes of JPEGs, only because we were able to rethink and refactor the way that compression happens. Because, uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, we did the same thing for a video codec. Instead of a stream of pictures coming in and a stream of pictures coming out, we, we did it in this functional way, where we understand the state of the system and how it mutates, and that allowed us to parallelize video encoding across sort of thousands of tiny little threads. And finally, we did video conferencing, sort of real-time video like Skype or FaceTime. Again, we used this functional idea to explore an execution path of the video compressor without committing to it. So we can try encoding a frame a certain way. If we don't like it, we want to go back, try it a different way. We did this with a sort of functional approach. And that allowed us to get much less latency. So that, you know, that delay you have in Skype, oh, can you hear me now? We reduced that by a factor of 4.6. So I'm going to tell you about each of these three systems, and please ask questions in the middle or interrupt, or you know, if you want to throw a... What, what again did you reduce by 4.6? The delay between when something happens in front of the camera and when it comes out the other side on the screen. So I'm going to tell you about each of these three. Well, let's start with the, the JPEGs. This was an NSDI, which is a computer systems conference last year. So the basic problem here, if you're Dropbox, um, you, you have told people that they can upload all their files to you. So suddenly you end up very popular, and you have an exabyte of people's files sitting there on hard drives, and that's very expensive. So roughly, before we did this project, roughly 40% now, about 35% of Dropbox is, is JPEG files. So you might ask, can the company save back in space? How would, you, how would you compress that? So what if I told you that this is how a JPEG file worked? Let's look at the little top down. This is how a JPEG file works. There's sort of three, three layer pan, three pancake of three layers here. So at the top level, there's pixels. There's intensities of, uh, you know, of, of luminance and chrominance, so there's some number between 0 and 255, that's how bright it is, and, and brightness or in the color angles. And we first transform that to try and compress the energy all in one coefficient. Is this sort of review to the people here? Should I? So we, we, we transform, we do a change of basis to try and put the biggest numbers in the same place. So we do a discrete cosine transform, 8 by discrete cosine transform. That's basically a lossless operation. You know, if you did it with sort of infinite precision, it would literally be a lossless operation. 64 numbers in, 64 numbers out. Next layer of the pancake is the lossy operation. We say, okay, we've transformed. Now we're gonna take these DCT coefficients and we're gonna start throwing away information. Because we're gonna say some are more important than others. The smaller values maybe we'll throw away. The higher frequencies maybe we'll throw away. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll quantize them. So you know, maybe we'll snap it to the nearest 16 or the nearest 32. This is the lossy state, it's called quantization. And then the bottom layer of the pancake is to say, okay, now we have all these numbers. These are quantized coefficients, quantized transform coefficients, we're just gonna write them out. But we're gonna write them out using as few bits as possible. That's an entropy coder. That's a lossless operation. And they do it using a Huffman code. So they have some probabilities of every possible value. It could be, you know, if we snap to the nearest 16, it could be 16, 32, et cetera. There's some probability that it's each value, and then uh, the probability is turned into a series of number of bits for each code word, and then we write out these code words. Each code word's an integral number of bits. All right, that's Huffman code. All right. So, so the Huffman code is for the whole block? Yes. Well, the whole, no, it's the whole image. So you, you, okay. uh, you just take, you take all the coefficients in a given block in a particular order, you write off those 64, and then you start right on to the next block. Okay, so when you say serialized, you mean block by block, I mean, sub-block by sub-block. Yeah, and each sub-block then becomes a series of bits. So yeah. the Huffman code. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's say you wanted to do better. Let's say I gave you a JPEG image, and I said, can you get it any smaller? Now there's a very simple way to do it, which is to just make it look worse. You know, open it up in Photoshop, there's that little slider from zero to 100, just make it look worse, and then write it back out. That works pretty good. That's not gonna work for someone like Dropbox, because you know it's a distributed file system. 
So they, they can't change the file. It, it has to look, if it's in someone's Git repository, it can't be like, well, it's almost the same, sir. It has to be literally the same file. But it's still possible to do it. So you could say, okay, we're gonna do a byte for byte reconstruction of the file. We're gonna do it by improving only that bottom layer. So we're not gonna change the quantization, we're not gonna change the transform, we're only gonna change the Huffman code. And so what's better than the Huffman code? An arithmetic code. So you can say, instead of having these code words have to be integral numbers of bits, they can just be arbitrary, we can approach the, the information rate. And so the way arithmetic code works is it just looks at the incoming symbols, like ones and zeros, and then it writes out some number of, well, it writes out some number of logical bits, and the number of logical bits in the limit is exactly equal to the sort of self-information of whatever came in. So for example, if I have a probability model that tells you I am dead certain the next input bit is gonna be zero, I'm very certain of that, and the next input bit is a zero, it doesn't cost me anything on the output, because I already knew it. If I say I'm dead certain that Hillary Clinton is gonna be the next president, I am so certain, and then it turns out I was wrong. It's a surprising event. <laughs> then it costs me a ton of output. I have to go, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, I have to write a very long thing. It's very, a lot of bits have to be written out. <laughs> um, so, so the quality of the arithmetic code depends on the accuracy of the probability model. How sophisticated, how accurately can you predict? So other people have worked on this problem. So we can graph here, there's a series of trade-offs between how fast, if you recompress these JPEGs with different kinds of entropy codes, how fast can you decompress? Uh, on the x-axis, and what is the compression? Sorry, on the y-axis, and what is the compression savings on the x-axis? So, for example, if you just say, you know what, let's try and make the transform more efficient, the entropy coding more efficient, by putting similar coefficients near each other. So we're going to rearrange the coefficients in the file uh, in advance, so that all of the high-resolution information will be in one place, and all the low-resolution will be in another place. Kind of like a wavelet. Uh, this is called the progressive JPEG. We put all the low-resolution stuff first, and then all the higher-resolution, and all the high-resolution. This is called a progressive JPEG. And it does save data. It saves like 7%, and you can decompress it very fast, like 100 megabits per second, just by rearranging all the things. So instead of each block being separate, we take the DC coefficient out of each block, put it somewhere, and the X coefficient out, put it somewhere. That's a progressive JPEG. Yes? Uh, sorry to interrupt. So uh, I, I see that the, uh, the, at the beginning, you introduced uh, the fundamentals about JPEG. And I can see that uh, the uh, image compression is a pretty popular field. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the recent year, they have JPEG 2000, mm -hmm. uh, and they have DPG, and they have the, uh, all kind of x -rec, and you, So can you, uh, can you, are you going to compare against uh, the, the, commercial, the, the commercially available codecs uh, 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 against yours? No, the answer is no, because we can only, but the company like that can only change the bottom layer of the pancake. They can only make changes that are byte for byte reconstructable. So yeah, it would be great to take the JPEG image in and re-encode it as an H.265 or an HEIF. But to do that is gonna change what the image looks like. I mean, it's gonna actually be a perceptible change, but it's definitely gonna change what it looks like on disk. So in the context of this, we're only talking about lossless compression. You're talking about better lossy compression. You are talking about better lossless compression that is recoverable for the exact same bits of the file. Okay. So it's not really about image compression. We're just about file compression where we happen to know that the outermost layer is a Huffman code. Okay. okay. So you can do this rearranging, or you can say, okay, let's get rid of the Huffman code, let's swap it out with an arithmetic code, and we'll have a sort of standard probability model that tries to predict is the next bit a one or a zero. And then the cost we pay is sort of how often are we wrong about that. And that gets you here. This is the sort of JPEG arithmetic code. You can decompress maybe 40 megabits per second, but you save, you know, maybe 13 or 14 percent. That's pretty good. Or you could be a crazy German person. You can put everything you have at this problem. Say, okay, we're gonna rearrange everything. Every coefficient file we're gonna go through, we're gonna sort them to put the most similar coefficients nearby. And then we're gonna have a really big model, like 100,000 different parameters in our probability model. And then we're gonna predict as best we can in an arithmetic model. Then we can decompress about 20, we can compress about 23%, but it's very slow to decompress. So this is sort of the state of the art. And the question they might ask you computer scientists is, can we do this? Can, can, a, can a company like Dropbox, a distributed file system, do this in real life? The difficulty here is that they, the file system never sees the whole file. This is sort of a computer science problem, but they don't have the whole file as a stream. They have it in little bits. So if you have put a JPEG file, here's your laptop, on Dropbox, what it means is if you put it, little pieces of it on different servers spread around the world and, and, and separately replicated. So there's a piece here that's bytes zero to n minus one, there's a piece here that's bytes n to two n minus one, there's a piece here bytes two n to the n. And if you want to retrieve the file, you have to go out to each of these three servers, retrieve the separate pieces, and concatenate them locally. That's how this distributed file system works. 
And the, the boundaries between these blocks are sort of set by the file system. It's, you know, it's every four megabytes, every one megabyte, but it's, it's not something that anyone else can control. So you want to ask the question, if you want to compress the individual piece here, so changing it from a JPEG file to some sort of hypothetical better format, like a lepton file representing the original bytes, how is that going to work? Because the laptop here still wants to be able to go out to these individual servers and download the original piece of the JPEG, the original substring of the original JPEG. So this is the difficulty. How do you compress the file if you never see the whole thing at one place? Now, I'm not going to suggest you have to be a rocket scientist to solve this problem, but so it's not something you can solve with the conventional tools. So the requirements here, just to be clear, you have to be able to store and decode the file in these independent chunks. So the chunks could be at any byte offset. And you have to be, you have to be able to decompress it really fast, and there's some sort of boring commercial challenges that are not very interesting. So the challenge here is that the baseline JPEG is encoded as a stream of these Huffman code words, and there's opaque state in the middle. So there's a DC prediction, for example, they separate, they subtract out the average values of these blocks. And the interface you get to the compression looks like this. It's a streaming interface. So you apply this Huff function to a vector of symbols. The symbols are like the coefficients. And the output you get is a vector of bits. So I need to go over, does that make sense? So the question is, how do you encode a chunk of the original file starting in midstream? So we want to start from one of these, one of these blocks starting in midstream. Midstream could mean in the middle of a Huffman code word. You know, we encode some symbol, it could output 14 bits. So that's one byte is eight bits, and then we have six bits from the next byte, and now we're sort of six bits into a byte, we've got two bits left. How do you encode a chunk of the original file? We're gonna, you know, because we're, we're converting from a Huffman code word to an arithmetic, so we go from arithmetic back to Huffman, but we might wanna start in the middle of a code word and with a sort of unknown prior DC value. So you can't do this sort of global sort. And in fact, even if it was just this, you can't do it, right? How do you start in the middle of a code word if this is your interface to compression? This seems like such a simple thing. It sounds impossible, I know. This is the problem with, with sort of this kind of interface. When a client retrieves a chunk of the A profile, how does the file server recode that chunk from the original, you know, our format back to JPEG? So the answer is, you gotta blow up the stream. And you have to blow up this function. Because this function has a variable inside it, it a local variable, that's the state of the system. And it's not functional. It, it, it is the thing that remembers, oh, I'm halfway into this next byte. And the lesson of this talk is kind of like that internal memory, that opaque internal state, that's implicit in this streaming interface restricts the applications that you can build around compression. So if you build a chip that only has this as the interface, you're gonna get lousy applications. That's what I'm trying to say. So instead, we formulated this JPEG encoder in a functional way, what we call explicit state passing style. And we implemented that as a, as a pure function that takes the state as a formal parameter. Uh, so the, the state, I, I, I really want to be clear here, it's a very, very simple thing. It's what is the partial code word that we're left on. So let's say that we, we encode some symbol and that it's a 13 bits. So that means it's gonna print out one byte and then how many bits are gonna be left over? Five. Five bits, yeah. So all you have to remember that state is, okay, I'm in the middle of a code word, I have five bits left over and those bits are 11101. That's the state and that was implicit before and we make it explicit. There's five bits left over and then 11101. So if you want to resume from now, you're going to give me a new symbol. But before I start encoding that symbol, first thing I have to do is print out 11101, five bits, and then I'm ready to resume. That's all we mean. That's all we mean in converting from a streaming interface with internal state to a functional interface with explicit state, is remembering, here's what I was in the middle of doing. And so we did that. The state contains everything required to resume from midstream. And you know, the actual Huffman state is like literally, it's some number of bits between zero and seven. That's all we're talking about. And then there's a few other things you have to remember is it turns out to be 16 bytes for the whole JPEG. That's all you have to remember is 16 bytes. And if you can do that, you can resume from any byte boundary. Yeah. So uh, before going, I have a very basic question. Please. So uh, what is the reason for storing a single JPEG on multiple machines? Because one, thing, one JPEG is like a couple of MBs. Yeah. Or even if most of the time it's a couple of KBs, so why, what is the need to say, put it on say 10 different machines? Well, so they, yeah, so that's a great question. Why do you store files on multiple machines? And the truth is that uh, Dropbox stores every file on multiple machines. They don't care if it's a JPEG or something else. Because the smaller pieces they can store these in, the more they're able to pack uh, information together in one place. So if they store the whole file somewhere, you know, they, they, they might have some, some left over at the, at the end. You know what I'm trying to say? They want to fill up every hard drive. 
So the easiest thing is to say we're going to divide the hard drive into four megabyte chunks, or one megabyte chunks, or something like that. And then we're going to cut each file into the same chunks and then just fill the boxes. Because if they have to worry about things being sort of variable length, then they're going to have leftover space. Also, this is sort of a unit of something that can be replicated. So if you can say we're going to store four megabyte chunks, then that gets replicated. So okay, we have a chunk, it has a name, and the name, you know, and that chunk is on three different places. And we just remember every chunk has to be in three different places. And every two weeks, we read all of Dropbox, and we make sure that every chunk is replicated in three places, and then we know, you know we're not going to go out of business. So if, if the chunks are of limited size, it's much easier to sort of reason about them and make sure that they're replicated uh, enough times. Whereas you know, if, you, if you could have one file that was 20 megabytes, then that one file would start to cause you a problem because you'd sort of have to worry about, oh, we got this one big file, make sure that thing's replicated. Whereas everything's the same size, then you, you, you know that the problem is of a constrained difficulty. Uh, the other reason you might want to do it is for parallelizing. So if you have to decompress an entire four megabyte chunk, that might be really slow. But if you can split that into eight mini chunks and run them in parallel and then just concatenate it at the end, that can be eight times faster. So that's another benefit, not robustness, but just performance, because you can break things up and operate independently. There's also the benefit of communication. We can see who's in different locations. And you see data from different uh, in fact, is it also important types of or? I think it does help the communications, yeah, because you know when this when this uh, laptop wants to download the file, it can talk to these multiple servers and they can all stream independently. And so the load is likely to be more spread out. Whereas, you know, if one computer just happened to have your files, it might also happen to have somebody else's files, you might have a sort of hot spot on that machine. Yeah. So the more you can sort of break things up and spread them around, the more equal the load's gonna be. So I think there's a lot of benefits to sort of storing things in small pieces. You know, your file system on the disk also stores things in yeah. blocks. Okay, so the, the point I wanna make here is we did something very simple you don't have to be a genius to do it, but you do have to break up this abstraction to do it. If your only interface to Huffman coding is this function, it's impossible to do it. Uh, so we did it, and ultimately the performance, just by breaking things up into little pieces, ends up being here. So it's nine times faster than the Germans, uh, and a little bit less compression, but almost the same. And we did that by breaking things up into little pieces and processing each piece in pen. And the only reason we could start to zoom from a byte boundary is that we could remember, here's what we were in the middle of when we started this chunk. Yeah? Uh, so just curious, so the compression speed is based on one machine or multiple machines? This is one machine. Yeah. Okay, so and here's some, this is an electrical engineering department, so here's some electrical details. <laughs> they, they decided, they, someone ran the economic numbers and decided it's worth running this to recompress all the files they ever have. So they're running 6,000 images per second through this thing, and so they have a cluster doing it and consuming about 280 kilowatts. So that's all the electrical, part of the electrical engineering. 280 kilowatts, and then at some point, they thought there was a bug in the program, and they turned it off. And the computers are not doing anything, but they're still consuming almost 150 kilowatts. Then eventually they decided, no, there's no bug in the compression, so they turned it back on, now they're consuming 300 kilowatts again. This is definitely the most electricity that any program I've written has consumed. <laughs> But you might notice that half that electricity is not going into the program itself. It's just sort of like blinking the lights on the computer and like spinning the fan and stuff. So if anyone here works on that kind of thing, it seems kind of silly that like 50% of the power is not going into the program. It's just going into, I don't know, whatever else computers do when they're not running my program. Um, some, some waste of time. I don't know. But anyway, this is a, there's definitely room to improve in sort of our energy efficiency of computer architecture. The, the bottom line here. It also shows that whatever you're doing, even 15% saving, over the long term, I could probably buy that. I'll put that on my stone. <laughs> yes, that's fair, that's fair, I, thank you. So I, I don't wanna blow this up into more than it really is. I mean, I think the message here is a tiny bit of functional programming can go a, a long way. The functional JPEG coder let the system distribute the coding with arbitrary chunk boundaries and parallelize one of each chunk. And that was the key for being able to do this and compress you know, 300 or 400 petabytes or whatever they're up to now. It's a tiny little thing, but if you only have that function of Compress a stream of symbols to stream of bits. You cannot do it. You need to be able to reach inside the system. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you mentioned the term functional uh, to the previous slide. Can you explain how that is different from traditional um, ways of programming? Well, it's not that different. Um, how, the question is, how is it different from traditional ways of programming? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you for example, you mentioned a functional JPEG codec, and how that is different from JPEG codec. Yeah, I mean, the only difference, I, I really, I'm trying to not make this into a big thing. The only difference is that instead of the function being a vector of symbols, 
here the function gives you a state every time it writes out a new byte. And so you can come back and say, okay, write out the next byte given here's your internal memory. So I'll make this more clear on the next slide, but it's, it's like one extra argument. It's not like a <coughs> paradigm shift. It's a small thing. Okay, so that's the, that's the JPEG. Any questions on that before I move on? Sure. Um, so how do you reach the compression rate of the Germans if you're still using the algorithm from? Just oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. Our probability model is 10 times bigger. Yeah, so we just did brute force machine learning. So theirs is like 100,000 coefficients, I think ours is like a million coefficients. Oh. And, and honestly, these JPEGs are, are um, consistent enough that you can, you know, it's an adaptive arithmetic code, so as the ones and zeros come in, you start counting in this context, here's how many ones and zeros I had. And those estimates converge pretty quickly to pretty good estimates. So um, it doesn't take, even if you break the file into little pieces, it doesn't take that long to get a pretty good probability model. Yeah, but working on that model is not something you, you uh, are measuring from, I mean, you're only looking at the compression speed and not on additional computation where you can use this uh, you know, more complicated model? Well, we're measuring the any speed effect of trying to apply the more complicated model into decompression, and that is factored in. Um, I'm not trying to get the speed. Yeah, so that all the machine learning is done offline? Is that no, 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 it's done adaptively online. Oh. It's really just, we started the property model, there's a bunch of bits, we say in this context, we've had zero zeros and zero ones. Then when we get a one, we say, okay, next time we've had one one and zero zero. We start with like a Jeffrey's Proctor, Beta prior way, we sort of one and one, and then you add, and it's not a fancy thing. It's a cool thing. <laughs> yeah. So you know the uh, sort of a complex key weighting type. That, say that one again. Yeah. Uh, is it like a complex key weighting type? Thing? Yeah. I think it's just called an adaptive arithmetic code, context adaptive arithmetic code. So Jeffrey's prior. I think it was Jeffrey's one and one, or is it zero, what, is it Jeffrey's zero and zero? I think we're. I would have. I think we start with one and one, honestly, which I would just call a beta. Well, I just call it okay, uniform. Beta. Let's just call it uniform. We don't have to be okay. smart people. Okay. Um, okay, so that was the JPEG. That's supposed to be a very simple thing. So now let's move into the, the research work. That, and I should say the JPEG is the only one that has met sort of deployment in the real world. So the one lesson I learned from this is like, sometimes only the simplest things can actually, anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, and you shared it with the world like this? Yeah, oh yeah, it's no so open source, thing, right? no patent. No. Well, ah, no, sorry, yes, Dropbox has patented the Wazoo out of it, but it is released oh. under an open source license. So the patents are licensed, you can use them. They are available for use. But yeah, I did not control. My academic work has no patents or and it's all open source, but the Dropbox is, yeah, I mean, uh, apparently you can, well, I, I haven't read the patent. What, can I check out? <laughs> <laughs> I wrote the patent. Anyway, I hate patents. <laughs> Anyway, it's in an open source license. You can definitely use it. Okay, let's talk about video. So this is a this is more with my uh, you know big big bigger uh, project here. But the idea is like if you think about what has made computers really cool in sort of the nineteen eighties, it was this idea of interactivity. You know, in the sixties and seventies, you go to the computer history museum. There were these punch card machines. Where you had to deliver a punch card, and then maybe a day or two later, they'd say, "Here's here's the output," and the output is like you know syntax layer on line two. And you're like, ah, darn, and then you have to come back. This idea of interactive computing was really what happened here on this soil in, in, in you know, Palo Alto, that, that you could instantly see the results of what you're doing. And now we actually have sort of interactive collaborative computing. So something like Google Docs, where I can make changes to a document, I type in X, and you, know, you see an X on your screen right away. Now, people don't actually read text anymore, right? Uh, what, what do people use on the internet? Video. Video, yeah. The, most of the bits crossing the internet are video. Actually, most of the bits crossing the internet is YouTube and Netflix. So two companies, most of the internet. And, um, and then most of the time people spend is watching videos. So you might ask, why don't we have this interactive collaborative editing for video? Why don't I have, you know, if I edit a video, why can't someone else immediately see the results? Has anyone here ever made a whole movie, like with their kids or anything like that? Yes. How long was your movie, sir? Uh, six minutes. Okay, did you edit it in any way? Yes. yes, and when you made an edit, how long did it take to sort of to render before someone else could see the results? A lot. A lot. In, in my case, because yeah. I'm so confident. It took a lot. Well, but like for the computer to do the render. Oh, uh, also a lot. Yeah, I know, yeah. That doesn't seem crazy like with a document, you didn't act, it's immediate. But a video, I mean, this is 2019, you make a tiny little change, like your kid, you know, barks, you want to edit out one second, and that can take like an hour to make the change. That should not be. So you might ask, if we could immediately edit a video, like what kind of cool stuff could we make? So you can say, you know, let's experiment, let's apply some filter in my video. Boom, it happens, see what happens. Or let's see like, 
Let's skip. When, I have a favorite actor. Let's see, when's the next time the actor's in the movie? Like, boom, find them. Or what if I have a least favorite actor and I want to edit them out of the video? Like, boom, they're gone. I just like instantly edit them. So why is this not possible? The problem is that video compression is really, really slow. So running this kind of pipeline takes hours and hours and hours, even for video. So you might ask, can we apply the sort of standard tricks of the Gates building, which is like hundreds of computers, thousands of computers, can you apply that standard trick of just use a lot of electricity, massive parallelism, to get interactive collaborative video editing? And the answer is maybe not. It's not so clear. And there's two challenges. One is that you, know, you would need thousands of threads, thousands of computers to start up right away to be able to do it, because we're talking about very big jobs. It's not clear how to do that. But even if you have thousands of computers sort of at your beck and call, it's not clear how to do it because the finer grain the parallelism of video compression, the worse the compression efficiency. Uh, and I'll talk about both of those things. So we made sort of two contributions here. One was a way to sort of summon up 5,000 uh, cores to do your bidding very quickly. And the second is a purely functional video codec, a non-streaming video codec that allows us to exploit this fine grain parallelism without compromising compression efficiency. So uh, the first part is just about the computing infrastructure, which is to say that we harness this new kind of cloud computing, which is called a cloud function. So the old style is sort of called the virtual machine, also came from Stanford. People have used these like Amazon EC2, Google Compute. So there you go and you say, I want to rent a fake computer, and they say, okay, it's booting up, and it, you know, they boot the operating system, and within sort of a minute, it's ready to go. And that, you, know, you get billed for roughly a minute, even if you use it for five seconds after that, they bill you for a minute, it used to be for an hour. There's this newer kind where you say, okay, I don't want to run a whole operating system, I just want to run one function. And for that, they'll boot it up in basically a tenth of a second. And they'll bill you again based on fractions of a second. So you can run whatever you want, you can say thousands of seconds, and the billing is kind of fun. So if you if you want to run an hour worth of CPU time, 3,600 threads for one second each, they charge you less than a dime. So that's kind of a fun thing to think about, something that would take you an hour. If you can do the software right, it could take you one second if you're willing to spend nine cents. So that sort of got us thinking. So we built a whole library to sort of harness these things and, and take a computation and spread it across thousands of cores, sort of start it up instantly. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. Second thing is, let's say you have thousands of computers ready to do your bidding. The problem is that doesn't mean you can encode a video and get good results. Because with existing video encoders, the finer grain the parallelism, the worse the compression efficiency. Now let's talk about why. This is the abstraction I showed at the beginning. There's a stream of pictures coming in off the camera. It goes through an encoder. There's a stream of bits, opaque bits. And out, it goes through the decoder, and out comes a stream of reconstructed pictures that approximate the original input. And the way this works so efficiently is that it exploits the redundancy, uh, the, the similarity between adjacent pictures. So the encoder can make use of the memory of the receiver. So let's say I was taking a picture, a video of you folks right now. The first picture I would have to send, here's everything I see. Oh, there's some light, and there's a camera, and then there's this person, there's this person. I'd send everything I see. And that initializes the memory of the decoder, the state of the decoder. That's called a keyframe. It sends the first picture in its entirety. But I, the encoder, can also tell the decoder, hey, you're gonna decode this picture, you're gonna put it up on the screen, but I also want you to save it in your memory. Take the picture that you've reconstructed and save it in memory slot number seven. I can tell the decoder that, put it in your head. And the next time that I, the encoder, send something to the decoder, I can say, all right, look in your memory. Look at memory slot number seven. And the background now is gonna be almost the same as memory slot number seven. Just Take the corresponding piece of what's in your head, memory slot number seven, and just add a little shadow to it. Or pick, you know, this person's face from memory slot number seven, just move it over to the left a little bit. If there's a car moving from left to right, you know, just take it, move it two pixels to the right. So that's called an interframe. It's a compressed frame that makes reference to the memory of the decoder. A memory that was put there because the encoder told the decoder to save a reconstructed image in a memory. And this is a big difference between these. A typical keyframe is like a megabyte. Typical interframe is 40 times smaller. So this makes a big difference to the actual use of, of bits, the ability to exploit the memory of the decoder. Now the problem, uh, as you can probably predict by now, is that that memory of the decoder is totally internal and implicit. There's no way to access it for uh, someone across the street. The interface looks just like that Huffman code. There's an encode function that takes a series of pictures, and the output is one keyframe and a bunch of these interframes that follow. And on the other hand, the contract is you can call the decode function, give it a keyframe and a bunch of interframes, and it'll split out reconstruction of those pictures. 
That's the interface. That's what you get from the software codec. That's what you get from a hardware codec. That's what you get. And the problem here is that this limits the kinds of applications you can make, this sort of streaming interface. For example, let's say you want to parallelize. You have 200 frames to compress. You can do it in serially. It's very easy. You say in code, you give it all 200 frames, and you get one keyframe and 199 interframes. No problem. Let's say we want to parallelize by dividing it up into 20 threads running concurrently. The first thread encodes 10 pictures, and we get one keyframe and nine interframes. No problem. But now the second thread encodes another 10 pictures, and it also spits out a keyframe and nine interframes. And the next thread spits out an extra keyframe, and the next one spits out an extra keyframe. We end up with 19 extra megabytes. That's because we wanted to parallelize. So the finer grain of parallelism, the more keyframes we have, and the worse compression efficiency. Why does it have to be this way? Wouldn't it be nice if we could tell this encoder, look, you don't need to send a keyframe. You can use the memory that's in the decoder because you know picture number 11 is probably pretty similar to picture number 10. So you can use the memory that's in the decoder and here's what the memory is gonna be. It's gonna be this in memory slot six and this in memory slot seven and this in memory slot eight and use that. Don't send a fresh. That would be nice. Say start encoding from midstream. Start encoding from the middle. Just like the Huffman code, start encoding from midstream. You got these few bits left over. That's what should be in your memory and then go wild from there. We could tell this guy, you got these pictures in the decoder's memory, and then go wild from there. That would be nice, but there's no language to do that because there's no way to discuss the state of the decoder. Um, the only sort of argument for this function is the pictures, the pictures in, the pictures out. There's a stream of pictures in, a stream of pictures out. There's no way to discuss the memory, the state that evolves inside the system. So there's no way to do it. So that's what we tried to do. We built our own implementation of a Google VP8, which is a video compression format, encoder and decoder, and we did it in this explicit state passing style, this functional style. So we formulated the decoder as an automaton. We said, okay, it's gonna be an automaton that changes states when it decodes a compressed frame. So it starts in some well-known state, and it receives a keyframe and decodes it, and that's a state transition to a new state. And then it receives an interframe and decodes it, that's a state transition to a new frame. Steve receives an interframe and decodes it, state transition to a new frame. And the state is what contains the memory when it's in slot six, seven, or eight. And as it goes through the state transition, it also outputs a picture for display on the screen. So this is our model of the video decoder as a finite state transducer uh, with a named state in the middle. And once you have that, and what's in the state, we should be clear, it's what's in these memory slots. So we started out, there's this picture in this slot, this picture in this slot, this picture in this slot, and also there's some ancillary state, like the probability table. So there's a Huffman code or an arithmetic code as part of the scheme, and there's a table that says, okay, here's the code book. You know, here's the probability table uh, that tells us what the code word is for each symbol. So that also evolves over time. So that's part of the state, that's the source state, and then some frame can spit out an image, but can also mutate the state. The encoder can say, okay, this picture that you're generating here, is my student made this. Is, anyway, this picture that you're generating here, I also want you to record it in this memory slot. So the new state has the memory slot change and the probability tables have changed. So this is the operation of decoding a frame, outputs one on the screen, but it also changes the state. And that's something we consider explicitly. Sorry, I got yep. a little confused. So sure. if you go back to, uh, there was one picture where you were saying, this, this one here. Yeah. So in order for the second encoder to say, you start with the 10th image, 10th uh, frame here, um, doesn't it have to uh, compute that 10th image itself? Because that won't be exactly, so basically the second encoder will have to run everything the first encoder has run, no? Well, yeah, let me show you the algorithm, but you're okay. not wrong. Okay. <laughs> I'll show you the trick we used to get out of it, but okay. you're not wrong. Um, so we ended up creating a compatible version of the VP8 decoder and encoder. So this does the exact same thing that the Google's version does, but it has one extra argument, which is the state, and the state is explicit. So our decode function is a pure function with no side effect. It takes as input the compressed frame, but also the state, what's supposed to be in its memory. And the output is a modified version of that state and a picture for display on the screen. That's the decode function. So if you want to decode a series of pictures, like you just download a video from YouTube and you want to play it, you could do it. We have to keep running this decode function, and every time we have to take the output version of the state and use that for the next time for the input version of the state. We just run that decode function over and over again. But other than that, it's, it's the same thing. We have an encode function that again takes the state object. So if you want to encode, you can encode given a known state. So I can say, assuming that the decoder has this in its memory, encode this image, and it's going to spit out an interframe. And finally, and this is the trick, we have something called the rebase so operator. The state here being these uh, photos, these images, 
and the probability. Yeah, exactly. That's the state. And finally, uh, we have a rebase operator, which is a little bit of a trick, which is to adapt a frame to a slightly different state, a slightly different state of the memory. So the input here is uh, the new state and the picture was supposed to look like and the old inner frame, and the output is a new inner frame that's been slightly modified so that it's applicable to a slightly different memory. So I don't know if anyone has used Git, the source control system. So this is a, a similar idea to Git. If I had a project that had a particular state in Git, and I wanted to implement a thousand different features. I could go up on uh, you know, Upwork or Elance, and I could ask a thousand different software developers, okay, I want you to implement your own feature. And they'd all do it independently based on the same state of the repository. And I'd end up with a repository that was very branched. It would have a thousand leads. And then if I wanted to actually use it, if all of these features were independent enough, Git would let me rebase them all back onto the original history, and I could get one linear history. So I could think things that were done in parallel and make them done serially, as long as they're independent enough. That's the rebase operator in Git, and that's what we're doing here. We're taking states or frames that were encoded, given one version of the history, and applying them to a slightly different version of the history. So I'll, I'll show you how we do that, and that, that's how it ends up being faster. So the algorithm here is to try and do as much as possible in parallel, where we encode tiny chunks, and then serially come back later and fix it up, and eliminate the keyframes and, and rebase. So I'll show you the algorithm. The idea here is we have a whole bunch of independent threads, like 3,600 threads in parallel, and we want to encode the video, and we want each thread to download a tiny number of frames, like much shorter than the practical interval between keyframes. So we start out to download, let's say, six frames, which is like a quarter of a second of a movie. And the first thing we do is we encode them the old-fashioned way. So we just run the old-fashioned encode function on the six frames, and the output is one keyframe and five inner frames. All right, so the, the arrow is the frame, one keyframe and five inner frames, and the circle is the state. So this is now a playable video. You could play the video here. You could say, I'm gonna play here, keyframe, five frames, great, and then I'll just start with this one. Keyframe, I just throw away the old memory, five frames, great. This is a playable video. It's a big video, but it's playable. So now the rest of this is just gonna be about how do we get rid of the keyframes. So the first thing we do is we take the state, the exiting state of each chunk here, and in parallel, we send that over the network to the next thread. This is parallel. So this one gets sent, this one gets sent, they all get sent in parallel. And then we're going to use our encode operation to re-encode the first picture as an interframe depending on this state. So it looks like that. So it used to look like that, and now it's going to look like that. Okay. So now we have a playable video from here. Keyframe, five interframes. Then I have this sort of Frankenstein interframe that takes me here, and then five more interframes. And now I'm stuck. I'm stuck because of the problem that you raised. Because th this was encoded relative to this state, which is now not the same as this state. So to fix that, I can't fix it in parallel, but I can fix it serially. Because the trick here is that the hard part in video encoding is searching for the correlations between similar pictures. So if there's some car in this frame, I have to look through the encoder's memory and see what is the most similar car. Uh, you know, there's a car four pixels over. If it's driving from left to right, I have to find the car is four pixels to the left and then tell it to move to the right. That's the hard part. But once I know that information, the much easier thing is encoding any differences that have happened in the meantime, which is called the residue. And that's the part that gets uh, the discrete cosine transform applied. So that we can recompute, that's much easier to do. So what we do now is we just take this chunk and we rebase it on here. And all we do is we recompute that residue. We keep the, the motion compensation the same, but the residue is different. So I'm gonna take this chunk and in serial I'm gonna rebase it here. And then now this chunk, I rebase it here, and this chunk, I rebase it here. I do that. So that's the algorithm. So the bulk of it happens in parallel, but at the end there's a sort of kicked up stage. All right, so you can do this with different number of frames in each chunk, a different number of chunks rebased together. Uh, but ultimately, let's look at how it works. So the first thing we look at is the compression performance. So on the y-axis here, we show the quality. This is in structural similarity, decibels. So this is the similarity between the original picture that came off the camera and the compressed version for different bit rates. So as the bit rate goes up, the structural similarity goes up. And what we see here in the blue line is the best you can possibly do. This is a single-threaded encoder from Google. Um, you know, it runs for a long time, but it does really good compression. And then here we see the multi-threaded encoder from Google. It breaks the picture up into a little, some number of pieces per picture. So they, they compromise on some compression quality or some size to do that. So now let me show you the dumbest thing we could possibly do, which is just divide the image up into quarter or second segments and not try and stitch them together. So that's much worse. So for any given bit rate, the quality is worse, and for any given quality, the bit rate's much bigger, because we have all those extra megabytes. 
the question would be now, what if we uh, do it in these, this is, so this is six frames, which is a quarter of a second, but just one, one chunk getting rebased together, so no real rebasing. So what if we instead rebase 16 chunks together, so we have four seconds, basically the same as the other encoder, and we end up here. So the rebasing allows us to hit, uh, within 3%, the same compression efficiency, the same quality as a function of compression uh, as the Google multi-thread encoder. So that's the compression. Now let's look at the speed. That very awesome encoder, the, the blue line, to encode a 15 minute video takes seven and a half hours. So that's really long. The multi-threaded encoder takes two and a half hours. What if you have infinite computers on Earth, but you don't have the encoder that can necessarily use them? So we just upload the video to YouTube, that takes 37 minutes until it's encoded. And then uh, if you run our encoder, it takes 2.6 minutes, it's actually now down to one and a half minutes because Amazon has just gotten faster. That's about, you know, 14 to 20, it's about 20 times more granularity there. So uh, YouTube is using chunks of 128 frames, we're using chunks of six frames. So it's about 20 times the granularity and ours is about 14 times, now about 20 times faster. Yes? A quick question, how do you control the compressor video quality of YouTube? We, we don't, we don't. So, uh, but th these are all the same quality, but this is just whatever YouTube wanted to do. Okay. Yes? Is your format just non-binary compatible anymore? Oh, it is, it is. It's the, it's the exact same. It, it, once it's here, it's a playable video because it's, it's one keyframe and then 95 inner frames. So, so yeah, no, what, what, I, what I intend to say is the stitching thing, will this lead to exact like, reconstruction or is there some additional loss that comes from rebase? Uh, well, there's a little, there is additional loss, but it's factored in in this graph. Okay. I mean, this graph is relative to the original image. Okay. So yeah, it's definitely not a perfect operation. And you said you obtain this black curve by doing rebreak stitching at some level. Like if you were stitching even longer, chunk, like um, I mean, over a larger scale, that would even go better. Or well, I think it's diminishing returns uh, because the image by the end of the four seconds does not look very similar to the way it did at the beginning right. of the four seconds. So there's much less cost of forcing a keyframe every four seconds. So here we end up with one keyframe every four seconds. So ultimately, I mean. The, the, to have this functional video coding that allowed us to parallelize with this fine granularity. We needed to be able to decide to inject the state, what is the memory of the decoder, in order to split this up into tiny little pieces. Uh, but I think there's a lot of things that we're going to want ultimately to you know, have 10,000 threads running at your beck and call when you push a button. If you think about sort of image and video filters or 3D rendering, you know, Pat Hanrahan has a student who was, she was the head of R&D for DreamWorks Animation. And she says when the artist wants to move a lamp over the character's head, it takes them like 10 to 12 hours just to see the result. And that seems like crazy. You, know, you can't be doing art where it takes 12 hours to see the fruits of your labor or, or you know, compiling software or machine learning or database queries. Or database. There's all kinds of things where you might want to push a button and rent 10,000 cores for a half of a second. So I think there's going to be a lot of applications where there's some button on your screen that says, okay, we can, I can do that calculation in an hour or I'll spin up 3,600 threads, I'll do it in one second, but you're going to have to pay nine cents and it'll just be a little meter on the screen. I think a lot of people, I would click this button. I mean, what, would, what would you do? <laughs> So I think that I think this is the way computing is going. But, but obviously also from a monetary perspective, like one hour can cost you energy, which is you know, energy that you pay for your money to be able to keep the computer on for that long. Yeah, so even this one is not free. Yeah, in fact, it's much more costly in some sense. Well, the power is about 10 cents per kilowatt hour, and a computer is about 200 watts, so it's maybe about two cents an hour to have a computer, I'd say. <laughs> yes, yes, that's fair. My, my salary is more, I hope more than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's one question. This reminds me of the comparison between the CPU and the GPU. So generally, uh, we find that if you do not have the, the data dependency, uh, um, uh, then it's much easier to use the GPU. And the same thing, I have a question here. So do you have any, for example, problem of uh, communication between these tiny threads? Would not cost, would, would they charge you for the communication? or will the communication become the bottleneck just like the GPU now, nowadays, the bandwidth is a bottleneck. Is that the case? In, in this particular application, the communication is not the bottleneck because there's not that much to communicate. You know, the, the active video compression is so CPU intensive that sending those states, I mean, states like nine megabytes, sending the state around is basically free compared with the computation. And there's people across the street that do big data processing where they have lots of data and they want to do something very simple to it. Those people care a lot more about communication. But this application is very CPU intensive. How about preparing the data? Basically, for example, a video, if you, I don't know how you uh, feed it into the codec, if it's the raw format, 
each uh, each 4K image will take this identity server of megabytes, right? Mm -hmm. So then that uh, means that you still need to store the raw data somewhere in order to spawn the tiny thread fast enough. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we do anything different than anyone else as far as storing or representing the original data. It turns out even downloading that is very cheap. Okay, I, I, what I mean is that if the person is done on a local machine, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I can either load it into a disk or into a memory. Uh, maybe you may not have enough memory, but the, the, trans, the data transfer is done locally. But now I need to transfer the data into the cloud. And uh, would that, would that even, I, I, I don't know why, I'm, I suspect it may take more time just uh, transferring the entire data into, is that the case? In practice, no. Oh. Um, you know, we sent this video to YouTube. I mean, we didn't start the clock. The 37 minutes starts when we finish sending it to YouTube. But sending it to YouTube takes like I don't know, two, two or three minutes or something like that. But that was much cheaper than encoding it. And you know, you could send a more compressed version. So for YouTube, you, you just send a low, uh, maybe a high quality version, and yeah. after YouTube, you encode it into a more compressed version. Yeah. And for the tiny thread, or are you doing the same thing? For example, we're using the raw video, but it doesn't make much difference. We could we could be on a high quality compressor, so it would be the same. Okay. Amazing. Okay, I want to try to get through the, the end of the talk, which is now about a, a real time case. So about video conferencing. So I don't know, have any of you tried to use? Have who here uses Skype or FaceTime or? Google Hangouts. Have you ever tried to use that on a mobile connection, like a cellular connection? Mm -hmm. So typically, you might see something like this. So here is this gentleman that's giving us a, a video conference about some NASA results, and we're going to see the network here get worse, and then it's going to get better again. So let's just see what happens in this conversation. He's talking, he's telling us something. The network, oh, it's frozen, it's frozen. Now the network's better, but it's still frozen, it's still frozen. It's kind of healing. Uh, now it's kind of bad. Watch that one more time. So watch what's happening with the network and see when it actually recovers. It takes a while. Has anyone ever seen this happen to your video conference? Yeah, and who did you blame? Were you like, oh, Horizon, it's so bad, I need to switch. Did you do that or Skype? Oh. Yes, yeah, Skype, that's the right thing to blame, yes. Because it turns out people tend to blame the internet service provider in this case. But as we see here, a tiny outage by the network goes out for one second got magnified into like a seven or eight second outage on the program. So the problem here is not Verizon or T-Mobile or anything like that. I mean, they, they contributed a little glitch. The problem is the software. And the problem turns out to be the interface between compression and the program. This is a, the actual Chrome 65, that was a real, real screenshot. So the, the problem as we see it is that the way these systems are built is by taking the packet building too seriously. Um, the, the way these systems are built, the engineering reality is that Video codecs have grown from sort of the early 90s into a very, very sophisticated thing, a thing that software engineers are sort of scared to muck around in, and a thing where no one wants to tie themselves to one particular video compression format. So if you uh, talk to Skype, for example, they will tell you they buy their video codec from someone else as a pluggable component. They actually buy it from Google, or they, they did buy VPA from Google. And Apple buys theirs, you know, H264 chips. There's a thing called the video codec in the system that exists, and it has its own sort of control loop. It's running it. It's running at 24 frames per second. And there's a separate thing in the system that does the networking, the transfer protocol, and that's running at some number of packets per second. And the companies that make the software, they buy these components and they kind of plug them together. And the interface, it's a screaming interface. The interface for the codec is the transfer protocol says, okay, here's what I think the target bitrate is. So I try and encode frames and kind of hit this bitrate on average. And the video codec sucks in frames off the camera. And occasionally, you know, it generates frames, maybe 24 frames per second the compressed frames that roughly have that target bit rate. That's kind of the interface. There's a stream of compressed frames that have the right bit rate on average. People have heard the term bit rate. So what is the problem here? Let's say you're the transfer protocol. You think the network can accommodate a certain sort of speed right now. What happens if the video codec generates a frame that's too big? What can you do if you're the transfer protocol? What are some of your options? You could, yeah, tell me some options. You could throw it away, great. What happens if you, the transfer protocol, throw away this, this frame, but send this one? What's gonna happen in the mind of the decoder? So this frame says, okay, take memory slot seven, change it, and then write something in memory slot eight. And then this frame says, okay, look at memory slot eight, change it, write something in memory slot nine. What's gonna happen if it gets this frame and it has not gotten this frame? Yeah, it's gonna be confused. It's gonna be reading something from memory slot eight that it wasn't supposed to read. So it's gonna be a corrupted image on the screen. 
But the transfer protocol is going to be very reluctant to drop a frame that's been encoded because the encoder has encoded this frame assuming that this frame is going to be received. It's encoded this frame assuming that this frame is going to be received. So they don't want to drop it. What else could they do? What was that? All right. Yeah, they could just store it locally. And they don't want to do that either because then they're like sending a frame late. So what else could they do? Tell Kodak to, to cause at a small, uh, encode your small one. Yeah, so they could tell the Kodak, okay, emergency, you got to slow down for future frames. They could do that. And what do they do with these existing frames? So I'll tell you what, what the WebRTC framework in, in Chrome does. They send them anyway. And then they say, okay, we just sent these frames that are too big. We must have screwed up the network now by what we just did. So we're gonna tell the codec to pause for a while until it fixes the problem that we just created. Because you can pause input to this controller much more easily than you can pause the output. Because you can just say, don't encode any more frames. But once it's output the frame, it's assuming that this frame will be received by this frame. So that's what they do. And that's why we see in this picture uh, why it takes so long for it to start sending again after the network gets better. So it's just sort of a bad way that these components are interfacing. So what we did is we took our functional video codec and we combined it uh, with the transfer protocol in a way that there's, the control is sucked out of it. So instead of having a separate control loop for the video codec, separate control loop for the transfer protocol, we suck the control out to one place. We have joint control of the compression and of the networking. So I'll skip the transfer protocol part and let's talk about the functional video codec. <clears throat> so we have a network protocol that tells us here's how big the next frame should be. Here's how much the network can accommodate. The problem is it's challenging for any video codec to choose the appropriate quality settings up front, the quantization tables up front, to meet a target size. They tend to over or undershoot. We, I guess we don't have a graph for that, but if you look at over time, what is the size of an individual video frame? It's all over the place. Because you know, maybe the frame turned out to be more similar to an earlier frame or less firm than expected. So there's a huge variation in the actual size. You have to average over roughly a second to get any sort of correspondence to the desired target bit rate. So you might say, okay, well, we're not gonna get it on our first try, but what if we just do trial and error? You know, we'll encode with a good quantizer. If it doesn't work out, we'll encode with a bad quantizer. You can't do that. Why not? That's the same reason as before, because when you encode a frame, the state is internal to the encoder. And so by encoding a frame, it assumes that that frame has been received. If you ask for another frame to be encoding, to encode it, it's gonna assume that the state that it induced is the one that was created in the decoder. So there's no way to sort of get multiple alternative options. So that's what we did. We used our functional video codec to keep that state parameter the same and explore, okay, let's try high quality, let's try low quality. And the one that we like is the one we're gonna end up using. So every time we go through that big control loop, the one that includes both the compression and the transfer protocol, we consider three options. Send a higher quality frame, a low quality frame, or just don't send the frame. And this means that there's no sort of frame rate to the system. It's just sort of, we send a frame when you feel like it. So let's see what that looks like. Let's say we have a, the decoder state is here, and uh, we encode a high quality frame that turns out to be 50 kilobytes, and we encode a low quality frame given the same state that turns out to be 25 kilobytes. Now we ask the network, how much can we send? It says 30 kilobytes. Which one should we send? We send the good one, or the bad one, excuse me. Great. So now we encode 50 kilobytes, 25 kilobytes, and the network says, okay, you can send 55 kilobytes. Which one should we send? Great, so we send the better one. And then now 70 kilobytes, 50 kilobytes, the network says we can do five kilobytes, which one should we send? Okay. Don't send it. So this is not something that WebRTC can do because they've already encoded it, they have to send it. So we just say, okay, fine, forget it, never happened. We'll take a mulligan. And then next time we'll encode new frames, but given the same state, we're given the same state. So the frame rate becomes sort of dynamic. It's not like a frame rate. It's just like frames are sent when the network can accommodate that, but now we can send this one. So, um, we, this is kind of a fun thing because it couples the compression much more tightly to the network. There's not like a video codec that's running on its own time and generating the frames. The video codec is generating frames sort of tightly when the network thinks they're uh, available. So we evaluated this sort of end to end. We, we took um, arbitrary video that we created and we put a barcode on each frame and we sent it through Skype and FaceTime and Hangouts and this is what it looks like when it comes back. It's all fuzzy but we can still recognize the barcode and see which frame it is. And then we can compare the, the frames. Now that we know which frame it is, we can see what's the delay between when the frame was on the camera when it came back, and then what's the quality. So here's the results. So um, well, let me show you a video first. So this is the same video from before. WebRTC is on the right, that's from Google, and our system's on the left. So we'll see the network getting worse and worse. Now they're both frozen. And here now, salt will be recovered. So this is still frozen, still frozen. 
out of stack. So that's just the benefit of changing the control loop. Let's look at what happens in the case of packet loss. So we're going to kill the network for one second and then bring it back. It's also be on the left, and you can see how much it's sending, uh, and, and like how closely it's able to achieve the target bit rate with these lines here. So you can see already WebRTC servers going wildly above and below what it's supposed to be at. It's also is much closer to the red line, which is the actual capacity of the network. So let's see what happens when the network dies for one second, starting now. And now we bring it back. It's also be back, it's still frozen, still frozen, now it's back. Let's try killing the network again. Now it's back. So you can see here when the network goes down for a second, it's just able to respond much more quickly because of this single control of the video of the network. Whereas you can see, WebRTC is all over the place. It takes many seconds to come back. Uh, so ultimately, if we look at the video quality, it's better than all the existing things. And if we look at the delay, it's, it's a 4.6x lower than the existing things. That's the frame in to frame out latency. Now, SalsaP is not using its fancy video compression as the existing things. FaceTime is using H.264. Um, and this is using some one graduate student's implementation of VP8. So how can this be that not only VP8, which is worse than H.264, but a bad VP8 encoder can outperform FaceTime? Here, here's on an AT&T network. Here's on a T-Mobile network. So how can this be? Why, why is it possible for one grad student in computer science to outperform a professional H.264 encoder? Very smart. <laughs> I don't think they're as smart as all the people who worked on that chip. Very smart people who worked on that chip. But the truth is that it doesn't matter as much as people think. The improvements to video codecs have reached a point of diminishing returns in this context, where there's uncertainty about the rate. But changes to the architecture of the systems have a lot of low-hanging fruit. It's just the chip doesn't matter as much as we thought. Um, if you're 70% as good as the chip, but 500% more accurate in predicting the target bit rate, you can outperform the chip. So ultimately, streams are fine, but if all you have is a stream and there's internal state evolving, it's hard to be creative. So I want you to think about, in those black boxes, the Shannon black boxes, what is the memory inside the black box? And that's what should be externalized. That's what should be made explicit. And you should be able to fiddle with the memory and resume from any arbitrary point. Because if you can do that, if you have a function, this is the Y Combinator, if you have a function, you can do all kinds of cool tools. So just the ability to save and restore the state of inside one of these boxes turns out to be a powerful tool. So I told you about doing that with a Huffman encoder. I told you about doing it with video encoding for parallelization. I told you about doing it with video encoding and the network for low latency video. And uh, I hope there's more to talk about. Thank you. So could you give us a sense for in the in the JPEG case, like um, why it actually does better? So even with a single threaded implementation, even if the file is only as big as one kind of chunk size, yeah. why are you better than the Germans? Like what microscopically happens that makes you faster? Yeah, we divide it up into eight pieces. Even, even if it's a single chunk on the file system, we still divide it up into eight mini chunks. Even though there's kind of just one CPU that's working at 100%. Oh, no, we use eight CPUs. Oh, uh, I see. Um, OK, and then for um, kind of in general, it seems like if you're uh, trying to parallelize this kind of functional approach and you're passing the state around, um, then as I mentioned, you kind of the, net, the end, end chunk has to wait for the state of the n minus first chunk. So do yes. they all have this kind of rebasing flavor after you parallelize it? Well, uh, let's think about it. The, the JPEG does not have the rebasing flavor because because the important thing in Dropbox is retrieving the file. Storing the file, they can save the original file for a day if they want and compress it on their own time. So the decompression is the only latency sensitive part. And by the time of decompression, we can write the exact states out at the beginning of each chunk. See what I'm trying to say? Because the encoder can go through it serially and say, here's exactly the information that the decoder needs to decode this chunk. So for the JPEG, we don't need the rebasing property. I see, so the encoding is still kind of not completely parallel to the decoding. Yeah, in, in Dropbox, the encoding is not, they don't care about how long that takes at all, because they just do it on their own time. Because mm -hmm. uh, the, the user's not there waiting for it to be encoded. The user only is waiting for the retrieval. So, that, so that's why the JPEG doesn't have that. Th th this one definitely does. And the only reason we're able to get a win is that long before you know the exact state that the encoder's going to need, you can get a pretty good approximate state. Uh, and then later, we just sort of slightly fix it up. So that's why we're able to get the trick with the video encoding, is that we can't get the exact state, but we can get a pretty good guess of it. And then with this one, we again do not have the rebasing property, because we just, um, 
we just save the, you know, we, we, we save the state, so we know where we are, and then we just encode both of them in two separate threads, and then one of them is the winner. So we don't have to do any sort of trick. So it's only that middle one that needs that ability to come up with an approximate state beforehand. I mean, this, this is not about parallelization. Yeah, right. I think it's for parallel encoding right. is when you need the trick. It seems like you could also have like randomized that or something. Like even if you have views of any store, the state of views is just that by decoding the file, then you could re reload it. Yeah, right? absolutely, yeah. yeah. So speaking of Jesus, did you try to do something in the spirit of what you did with, uh, with the Huffman coding with um, uh, Jesus? Um, I, I didn't. You know, the truth is that Jesus was our competitor because prior to this work, they just did uh, Zlib for every file in Dropbox. So, um, and they, they were perfectly happy with the speed of the Zlib decompression. So I think you could accelerate the speed of Jesus decompression if you wanted to, but they were already, that was not the bottleneck for them. But I think if you wanted the speed of Zlib decompression, you could absolutely parallelize it by putting some sort of um, explicit state in it, which would be what, the, the current dictionary and something like that. I think you could do that. And I think the point here is that the traditional- so, so then what, what is the bottleneck for them? I think it's just the, the network connection between Dropbox and their customer. Or it might be encryption, honestly. Encryption is much harder than GZIP decompression. Um, I, I think one point to emphasize is that traditionally random access of these things has also involved reinitializing the state. You know, you could, you know, one way to do random access in GZIP is say, we'll just divide the thing into 10 megabyte blocks and GZIP them independently. Or in video, you know, one way to have random access to, is to insert a keyframe. But when you do that, you lose the compression gains. So I think that one benefit with this explicit state approach is that you can create a random access opportunity that does not affect the common case. So the user who's just reading the whole file straight through doesn't have to reset their compression state. It's only the user that wants to be able to seek to the middle of the file. They go and opportunistically fetch this, um, you know, the state resumption uh, state, and then they can resume from the middle of the file without, without having to hurt the people who are just reading all the way through. Yeah. Oh, so in the, in the Chrome case, so when there is a network failure, um, the, the uh, standard just decides to discard the uh, video frames that the change the similar effects at the uh, the soft file. So if the standard discards the video frames, yeah, because imagine that the uh, Chrome decides to just send the encoded frames right away, right? Yeah. So if they send the standard here. frame anyway. If you, well, the problem is if the transfer protocol, which is the standard, discards this video frame, this video frame is going to corrupt the screen because this video frame was encoded with the assumption that this video frame will be received first. So if you just throw away this one, then this one won't work. That's why they're reluctant to do that. Did you all see an artifact in the, in the screen and just a nice keyframe arrive to clean the error? Okay, so besides the artifact, then it will be just a there won't, won't, won't be like a, a time period that there's no data received, right? Well, it'll be a time period with like you know, really screwed up frames received. I mean, that, that would really hurt their performance on the, the quality metric. You know, the, this metric here measures how good it looks. And so if you started showing a bunch of messed up frames, it would, it would look a lot worse. Okay. Maybe we can take the last. All right. Thank you very much.